let's assume a business had the following balance sheet. So you can see its assets and liabilities and owner's equity there. So there's a lot of good information in that balance sheet. The problem is it doesn't help us answer questions like which of those liabilities must be repaid first. So if we look at these. It doesn't say which ones are due soon and which ones are due uh, not as urgently. Secondly, which assets will become cash soon? Well, obviously cash is already cash, but these ones here, will these become cash soon or are we planning to hold onto them for many years? Will some assets be owned for many years, like the property? Uh, and lastly, have we got enough money to pay our liabilities either maybe this month or this year or in 10 years? I don't know um, the asset and liability time frame, so I can't answer that question. So this balance sheet, while it's uh, good, it doesn't tell us any of this information. So what we do is uh, we learn this in Year 12 Accounting. We make sure we classify each item in the balance sheet. And what that means is assets are split into the assets. Uh, current assets, those are the ones that will be turned into cash or used up within the next 12 months. And some examples of cash or inventory or debtors. And non-current assets, assets that the business will own beyond the next 12 months, for example, property and vehicles. Likewise, we do the same with liabilities. The current liabilities are debts that must be repaid within the next 12 months, e.g. bills and expenses, so maybe a phone bill, power bill, ca uh, taxes to the government. Short-term loans, so loans that have got a time frame of less than 12 months, and also our accounts payable or creditors. Then we have our non-current liabilities. They're the debts that will be repaid after the next 12 months. So for example, long-term loans or mortgages. So what we'll end up with is instead of the balance sheet we saw before, we'll have it broken into sections or classified into current and non-current. So we've got our current assets there and we total them up. We've got our non-current assets and then we have an overall total for total assets. Current liabilities, we've got two. One of those loans is due on 180 days and the account's payable. And non-current liabilities, we've got one. The other one was due in 10 years and we also have a mortgage. So what we can do now is start to answer, answer those questions. Which liabilities must be repaid first? Well, clearly these two are due in the next 12 months. So we'll go uh, pay those first. Which assets will soon become cash? Well, we've got these ones here. So inventory and accounts receivable should become cash in the next 12 months. Uh, will our some assets be owned for many years? Yes, we've got a property and a vehicle. So we're expecting to own those for more than 12 months. And lastly, have we got enough money to pay our liabilities this month, this year, in 10 years and so on? Well, the two numbers for this year, we can see current assets. So these are the ones that are cash or will become cash of 35,000. And we owe 20,000 over the same time frame. So it looks like we're in pretty good shape. We have enough current assets to cover those current liabilities. And the reason why we classify things is because it helps us distinguish between businesses when we're making decisions. So we've got business A and business B. If we said, who would you rather be? Both businesses had assets of 100,000. You can't differentiate between the two. What about if we said they both had liabilities of 70,000? Well, again, that doesn't tell us anything different. I can't distinguish between business A and business B. So what we do is we uh, classify items. So if we've got current assets of 50,000 for business A and non-current assets of 50,000 versus business B having uh, current assets of 20,000 versus non-current assets of 80,000. Well, based on that information, I'd probably take business A. They have more current assets, so we should expect more cash within the next 12 months. However, what if we had all the information? What if we were given liabilities in classified form as well? So for business A, its current liabilities are 60 and its non-current at 10. But for business B, it's the opposite. Well, looking at that information now, I'd actually prefer to be business B. And that's because whilst it has less current assets, those current assets are double the amount of current liabilities. So business A is all well and good. It's got $50,000 of current assets. But the problem is it's got $60,000 of current liabilities due. And this all comes down to relevance. We classify a balance sheet in order to be relevant. And that means we can use it to make decisions uh, in the future or by evaluating past decisions. So fundamentally, that's why we're doing a classified balance sheet to make decisions such as how am I going to finance my current liabilities? Well, for business B, that's easy. We've got enough current assets to do it. For business A, well, the math says they don't. They're going to have to go and find some more money. Should we sell some of our non-current assets? So if I'm business A, I might look to sell some of these 
in order to get the cash and make this number bigger. So that helps us make a decision. Should the owner provide capital? So again, do we want to bump up cash by making a capital contribution? What about if you're not the owner of these businesses, you're thinking about buying shares, who would you rather buy shares in? Well, clearly, I'm going to go with this business here just because I know there's less risk of it going broke in the next 12 months. What about if you're a supplier, you're selling goods to one of these businesses on credit and they want terms of, say, 60 days? Which one would you pick? Which one's going to be better able to pay you back? And lastly, what about if you're a lender, you're a bank? Banks love to look at this information because they want to know which firm they should lend to because it's all about risk. Which firm's riskier? And business B would be a better proposition because its current assets are bigger than its current liabilities. Let's look at a real world example that demonstrates this. It's uh, Centro Properties. They own shopping centres in Australia and New Zealand. So you might have seen several throughout Melbourne. They've actually changed their name to Federation Centres. And then they've actually changed it since uh, I think 2011 they changed from Centro and Federation uh, I think last year became Vicinity Centres but it's all the same company under a different brand name. And the issue for them is their balance sheet for the 2006-07 financial year. So you can see it's a balance sheet set out just like we do ours in year 12. In reality it's a little more complicated than that. There's uh, notes and other pages summarising different items but um, fundamentally it's got the same info that we can read uh, in year 12 accounting. And in particular that item there, loans. Under current there are no loans current uh, as listed as due within the next 12 months. But you can see under non-current, the loans are valued at about $3.6 billion. The other figures we want to pay attention to are the total current assets to the total current liabilities. Based on that, it looks like we've got plenty of current assets to cover our current liabilities. However, a few months after releasing that balance sheet, uh, the company made an announcement saying they needed to restate some figures in it. And specifically, there was a $1.1 billion loan from a bank called JP Morgan that was originally classified as non-current when in fact it was current and due in three months. So what happened was $1.1 billion needed to go into current and $1.1 billion needed to come out of non-current. So the real numbers should have been those. So we can see the current liabilities have gone up and the non-current liabilities for loans have gone down. So they needed to find $1.1 billion in three months. Now it seems like a really dumb, obvious mistake to make. How could a big professional company do that with proper accountants and uh, hiring accounting firms and so on? Um, but it wasn't that simple. It was more about uh, the fine print and the terms of these loans and certain conditions that got triggered. But fundamentally, they've basically misclassified a loan that should have been current that they were calling non-current. So here's the new balance sheet and you can see there's loans have gone up from zero to 1.1 billion as current um, and also the loans in under non-current have gone down uh, but also the big issue here now is well, let's look at our current assets to current liabilities and we seem to have a problem these current liabilities are bigger than the current assets and that's had a negative impact on the firm's liquidity so that's a word we need to know uh, in year 12 accounting we need to be able to define it it's our ability to meet our short-term debts as they fall due. So let's look at the first balance sheet and compare it to the second balance sheet. What are we talking about? Well, the top one's wrong and the bottom one's correct. So what's the difference? We can see current assets in the top one and current liabilities in the bottom. Um, and in both, the current assets are the same. So there's no issue there. They are both the same. The issue comes with in the wrong balance sheet. It's only 656 million. Whereas in the actual, actually correct balance sheet, it's 1.75 billion. So why don't we look at our working capital ratio? That is a measure of liquidity. So looking at the first balance sheet, we've got a working capital ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. Let's plug our numbers in. There's our current assets. There's our current liabilities. We get a ratio of 2.04. Very healthy. We'll explain what that number means in a moment, but uh, any number above one is good and any number above two is fantastic. Let's look at that second balance sheet and calculate the same formula. So current assets are the same. However, the current liabilities are much different. And when we put that in, we actually get a ratio of 0.76. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back to the first balance sheet, the one that was wrong. It means for every dollar of current liabilities, the business has $2.04 of current assets to pay them. So they've got double the amount they need to cover those current liabilities for the next 12 months. 
In the second balance sheet though, for every dollar of current liabilities, there's only 76 cents of current assets. So we want to be able to explain that in words and make sure we can write that in a sentence when we're doing our own analysis in uh, Year 12 accounting. But fundamentally, you can see a really big difference between these two balance sheets. And the liquidity of the second balance sheet is terrible, but the liquidity on the first balance sheet is terrific. The problem is it was wrong. That's not correct. So let's have a look at the impact of that on the share price when it was announced in December. And the problem there, as you can see, the share price has gone from just under $6 all the way down to under a dollar and it got much, much lower than that. But the day that they announced the error was actually there. And you can see in one day, the share price basically fell about $5 in one day, which is about 80%. So shareholders were really impacted. We talk about relevance and decision-making. Well, obviously when this came out, the decision everybody made was, I wanna get rid of Centro shares. No one's buying them, everybody's selling them. And that's why the share price went down. So the company nearly went bankrupt to the point where it had to change its name to Federation Centers to sort of disassociate itself from the chaos. And we saw now it's actually changed its name again. The Australian Securities and Invest Investment Commission, they're kind of like the white collar police, the financial police. They sued the seven directors on Centro's board. And what they sued them for was breaching their fiduciary duty. And basically what they said was you didn't scrutinize those, that first balance sheet correctly. How could you miss something so obvious? And what happened was they went and looked at all the fees that these directors and one of them was the CEO got. So you can see um, they range from sort of $100,000, which is a lot of money, up into the $3.5 million, all for a year's work. So they're getting remunerated very well. Um, they all got found guilty. They didn't show proper fiduciary duty. They didn't scrutinize that balance sheet uh, originally correctly. And they all got found guilty. So that's why we want to make sure that we can read a balance sheet. We know what classification means and we're looking for things in current and non-current. Luckily for them, it's Australia and white collar crime is really, it's a slap on the wrist. In America, you get serious jail time, but here only one person got fined and that was the CEO, Andrew Scott. He got a $30,000 fine, which is a lot of money, but when you're making $3.586 million a year, um, that's really not that big a deal. All right, well, did they get banned from running other companies or some sort of punishment? No, none of them got a ban either. So these people got off very lucky. There were extenuating circumstances. They actually aren't the ones that prepare the balance sheet. It was done by an accounting firm uh, called PricewaterhouseCoopers, and these people signed off on it. So they are responsible uh, indirectly, and really you'd think for the money they're getting paid, that it'd be such a, a thing. You'd, you'd probably ask that question, wouldn't you? When is this loan due? So let's look at some questions to answer. What is a classified balance sheet? Do you know what that means? Secondly, and most importantly, why is a classified balance sheet prepared? And what has this got to do with relevance? Why don't we just leave them all under one big heading for assets and one big heading for liabilities? What mistake did Centro Properties make when classifying the $1.1 billion loan in the first balance sheet? And lastly, how did this mistake impact Centro's liquidity in terms of its working capital ratio?